Welcome. This is the first lesson in Calculus 1, and we begin with Chapter 1, Chapter 1 on Functions. Chapter 1 should be kind of a review, so I'll go through a little quickly. We'll hit two sections today, 1.1, a review of functions, and 1.2, representing functions. Let's dig in. So take a look at the outline on the left. We have review of functions and representing functions. So I'll hit a few categories in each. So we begin with just functions in general. We have different ways of representing functions, but always a function has an input and an output. The input is called the argument of the function, and the output is the function value. We're going to use this phrase a lot, function value. So whenever you think of the function value, whenever you hear that phrase, think of the output of the function. Functions can be written using this functional notation, f of x. In this case, your input is x, and the output is x squared. So if I put in 5, the result is 25. I could write a function as a relation of two variables. In this case, y is a function of x. And I can even split up my argument. So if, uh, if the input is less than 1, I have a certain output. My output will be 2. And if, the, and if the input is greater than or equal to 1, then the output will be 3. This is called a piecewise defined function. This is not a function. f of x equals plus or minus the square root of x. If I tried to do something like this, let's say f of 9, how would that evaluate? Uh, let's see, plus or minus the square root of 9 equals plus or minus 3. So like 3 and negative 3, I have two different values. That is not allowed. The key feature of functions is that only one number is returned. Only one number comes as the function value. I put one number in and I get one number out. The domain of a function f is the set of all x values that make f of x a real number. So how about this example down below? The square root of x minus 100. Well, I'm only going to deal in the realm of real numbers. So underneath the radical sign, that guy has to be 0 or greater. I can't put in negative numbers under the square root sign. So maybe I think to myself, x minus 100 is greater than or equal to 0. I can have 0. The square root of 0 is 0. That's perfectly fine. And what does that tell me about x itself? That tells me that x is greater than or equal to 100. So there's the domain of that function x is greater than or equal to 100. Here's another example we come across a lot, fractions. And what do you know about the denominator of a, frac of a fraction? The denominator can't be 0. We are not allowed to divide by 0. So in this case, I know that x minus 5 is not equal to 0. So oh, what that means for x is x does not equal 5. x can be anything else in the world, any other real number, except 5. So those are the domains of those two functions. Now, the flip side of domain is range. The range of a function f is the set of all the values of f of x as x varies over the domain. So in this first case, f, imagine plugging in all possible values of f, I'm sorry, all possible values of x. What are all the outputs going to look like? And in g, if I plug in every possible value of x, any x that isn't 5, what do all the possible outputs look like? Now, computing range tends to be a much more difficult problem than computing domain. So I won't do it for these problems, but these aren't too bad. Maybe you can see that uh, it turns out that for the f, the range is all non-negative numbers, anything 0 or greater. And g is a little bit trickier. The range of g is any number except 1. So I won't go into the de details, but maybe you could figure that out. All right, composite functions. Let's say we have two different functions. f of x is x plus 3, and g of x is the square root of 4x. How would I figure out f of g of 25? So I always work from the inside out. The first thing I want to do is figure out g of 25. And so I go to the g function, I plug in 25, so that looks like the square root of 100. The square root of 100 is 10. So I'm going to replace g of 25 with 10. And f of 10, now I go up to my f function, 10 plus 3 is 13. What about f of g of x? So the g of x 
is square root of 4x. So I'm just going to, going to plug in square root of 4x in place of that g. f of the square root of 4x. Now the result of that, plugging square root of 4x into f, is square root of 4x plus 3. It's important to remember that the way a function is defined, look at this f up on top, that x can be anything. It can be x, it can be t, it can be y, it can be a complicated expression. Uh, f of anything is that thing again plus 3. So f of the square root of 4x is the square root of 4x plus 3. So using that idea, let's take a look at this uh, last problem. f of t minus 2k is t minus 2k plus 3. That's the function value of f at t minus 2k. So completing the problem now, we have g of t minus 2k plus 3, and all that stuff takes the place of x in my definition for g. All right, moving on, let's take a look at symmetry. So occasionally, functions are either even functions or odd functions. Now, not every function falls into this category, but even functions have the property that if you plug in negative x or if you plug in positive x, it doesn't matter. It actually gives you the same value back. So for example, maybe you plug in f of 5 and it gives you 4. You plug in f of negative 5 and it also gives you 4. Plugging in a number and it's negative both give you the same thing. Graphically, that's what this picture shows up above. Maybe this a is 5 and the result is 4. And if I plug in negative 5, the result is also 4. Even functions have symmetry across the y-axis. Another kind of symmetry is seen in odd functions. They have the property that f of negative x is negative f of x. So once again, if I put 5s and 4s into this picture, maybe f of 5 is a positive 4. But if I negate the 5, f of negative 5, I'm going to negate the output as well. I get negative 4. Odd functions, we say, have symmetry about the origin, or symmetry through the origin. All right, let's move on to 1.2, representing functions. And the first big way of representing functions is with formulas. And functions fall into two broad categories. There are algebraic functions and there are transcendental functions. And imagine starting with x. You have x in your real numbers. For algebraic functions, it's all the, the, the results of uh, multiples and addition and subtraction and division, uh, raising to exponents and, and uh, taking roots. Any algebraic operation I can do with x and with real numbers is going to result in an algebraic function. When I raise quantities to powers, I, I do restrict that I am going to only raise them to real number powers. I don't raise them to variable powers. And if I take roots, taking a root is like raising a number to a fractional power. Transcendental functions are functions that simply are, I mean, they're good, they're useful, but uh, they can't be defined in terms of the algebraic operations. So things like the trig functions, your exponential functions, those are transcendental. Now, coming back to the algebraic functions, those divide up into two smaller categories. There are polynomials, and polynomials are only the result of addition and multiplication. I can multiply x with itself repeatedly. I can add x powers together. I can do subtraction. I can uh, take real numbers. But in terms of the x's, I'm only adding and uh, multiplying. Now, if I allow if I allow division by polynomials, then that produces rational functions. Rational functions are the ratios of two polynomials. And then this third guy out here, it's still an algebraic function. It just doesn't fall into either of those two categories above. All right, so that's representing functions with uh, with formulas. How about with graphs? What does the graph of a function mean? Here's a function given symbolically. f of x equals x squared minus 2x minus 1. How do I get from that to the picture? And here's the idea. I start plugging in values. f of 0 equals negative 1. And so I'm going to make an ordered pair, 0, comma, 
negative 1, that's a point that I can plot in the plane. I will plot the point 0, negative 1. And now let's just try something else. f of 1 equals negative 2. So I will plot the point 1, comma, negative 2. And we get a point in the plane. And I try something else. Uh, f of 2.71, it turns out, equals 0.9241. And if I plot that point in the plane, I get something kind of over there. And I imagine doing this again and again and again, forever and ever, many, many, millions, millions of times, plotting points. And I'm going to get a whole bunch of points in the plane. And it turns out that if I plot enough of those points, that I get what looks like a nice, smooth curve. So in fact, the graph of f is the set of all points x, y, such that y equals f of x. These are input-output pairs of my function. It's good to think of the graph of a function really as a set of infinitely many tiny points. Don't think of it as a curve snaking through the plane. It's really just a set of points, and every point represents an input-output pair. All right, moving on, let's take a look at some common functions. So these are the graphs of some common functions. At this point, pause the video for a minute, see if you can identify all of these graphs, and then when you're ready, unpause it, and I will reveal the answers. All right, I hope you did that. Let's take a look. So this first one, x squared. After that, we have x cubed. So, and these are two prime examples of a function with even symmetry, so x squared has even symmetry, and x cubed has odd symmetry. This third graph, that's the graph of the absolute value of x. Now the next two might be a little difficult. This is an exponential function, and this is a logarithmic function. The exponential function here happens to be e to the x. You can see when I plug in 0, I get out 1, because e to the 0 equals 1. But what about when I plug in 1? e to the 1 equals e. And if I trace that up, it gives me a number up there. And e is a number that's about 2.7. Now, if I take this graph, the graph of e to the x, and I flip it over the line y equals x, I get this picture of the log. And this is the graph of the natural log of x. The two that remain, these are sine and cosine. So sine x is on top. Cosine x is the one on the bottom. Sometimes people have a hard time remembering. Uh, sine goes through the origin. So always start right at the origin. Sine goes through there. And cosine makes a little hill over the origin. With sine, maybe you can think uh, if you trace the graph around the curve, or trace the graph around the origin, it kind of looks vaguely like a stretched out s, s for sine. And the cosine, uh, its hill, looks like a little sideways C. There you go. S for sine, C for cosine. The last thing I want to talk about in this first lesson is graph transformations. And I have a little GeoGebra demonstration for this. All right. So we have a function g, g of x equals f of x. And I want to either, either uh, translate this around left, right, up, down, or scale, which is a stretch and compress. So what happens if I want to vertically translate? Look at this. Look what's happening. My original graph is being transformed. The solid graph is my graph of g. And the one that stays behind, the dotted line, that's f. So if I take my original graph and I add 3 to it, that has the effect of translating up. Because, because my vertical axis is registering the outputs of the function. Those are the y values of the function. So by adding 3 to the function f itself, I'm adding 3 to the outputs. So if I add 3 to f, it moves the function up. If I subtract a number from f, it moves that graph down. Now what about horizontal translation, moving left and right. This one works opposite of what your intuition probably tells you. Look at this. If I add a number to the argument, oh, and by the way, I should say, notice how the, uh, the modification we're making is that we're adding now to the argument, not to the function itself. If I add a number to the argument, it actually moves the graph left. 
and if I subtract a number from the argument, it moves the graph right. And of course we can combine my horizontal translations and my vertical translations. I can either add or subtract from the entire function, or I can add and subtract from the argument to the function. All right, so let me take those both back to zero, and we'll look at another modification, scaling. So scaling is like stretching and compression, compressing. I can stretch vertically, and the way I do that is by uh, multiplying times the function. You know, vertical change is affecting the output of the function, so that's why this, uh, this factor is being multiplied times the entire function. Compressing occurs when I have a number less than one in front. It's a positive number and it's less than one. And it compresses the function, it squeezes it down close to the x-axis. Well, what happens if it becomes negative, that factor out in front, that actually flips the graph uh, vertically. And I can flip it and stretch it by taking a large number, a large negative number. All right, so that's my vertical scaling. And last one is horizontal scaling. In this situation, I am modifying the x, I'm multiplying the argument of the function itself. And if my number is bigger than one, it ends up being a compression. And if my number is less than one, then it's stretching horizontally. And by putting in negatives there, I also have the same kind of flipping effect, but now it flips horizontally. All right, so I will leave the video at this point. We've covered the basics of functions in 1.1, 1.2. Uh, give the homework problems a try, and let me know if you have any questions.